Patreon request time. Hey everybody, AJ back again with the Mighty Glue Stick channel. When they were handing out Ds, I said make mine a double. Hmm, okay, I'm never saying that again. Right, Demon Lords. One specific Demon Lord. He is known as the Prince of Deception, the Lord of Hollow's Heart, the Master of Shapes, the Turned One. In the original Greyhawk campaign in the 1970s that Gary Gygax ran, um, Ailerach, played by Mark Ratner, and Eric's cousin... Uh, played by Ernie Gygax, had both obtained Vorpal Swords that were ruining the campaign. They stumbled into Fraz Ub Lu's prison under Castle Greyhawk and freed him. Big mistake. The adventurers panicked and used a scroll to call in the god Zeus to save them, but he ignored their pleas, and Fraz Ub Lu took them to his abyssal realm, destroyed their swords, and sent them packing. Fraz Ub Lu is known throughout the abyss as Scum, his name reviled by any demon powerful enough to oppose him openly. Even his servants loathe him, but they're too afraid because of his wrath and um, don't speak of it or are not in control of their own actions. So today's video is a patron request video. This means that it's not available to the general republic. Republic. Public. It's an exclusive. And I'm going to show you um, basically all of the material that I read through in order to make one of my condensed down and in my own words five page scripts so this is the totality of the material that i've uh, researched on fraz Urblu. it's about 18 pages worth and i'm going to read it out to you verbatim um, so that you can see the difference when i eventually do make a uh, public video about this guy um, the difference between what i read through and the the total information on something and how much and how different it is when i present it to the public so here we go without further ado uh, and thanks for the request, by the way, patron. Um, doesn't matter whether you've been with me for a long time or a short time. If you request uh, specific content, I will get cracking on it. So here we go. <clears throat> Fraz Urlu, Urblu's origins lie in another plane altogether, the Nine Hells. He was once a devil of tremendous power and of equal to ba Baal and Mephistopheles, Mephistopheles, whose ability only matched by his vanity. He constructed an iron tower in the second layer as a testament to his own strength and declared himself a ruler over all below it. So this would be, the entrance would be below Tiamat's lair, um, and it's a huge cavern complex with, uh, I believe, the the towers of the um, the punishment, the 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 they're imprisoning the chained devils up above, if I remember correctly. So there's an iron fortress there. Uh, he constructed the iron tower, and for its uh, its. It's yeah, it's purportedly impregnable summit. He gloated his superior over superiority in a magically amplified voice that was heard across the nine hells this proclamation infuriated asmodeus who ordered another devil who would soon become the iron lord despater to infiltrate his lair and usurp him usurper Fraz Urblu's power lay in the construction of the tower itself, a complex network of intricate traps and puzzles that granted its master total power within its walls. So great was it that Fraz Urblu could not contain mastery of it himself, it had to be placed in separate receptacle. In order to obtain it, despite a requested from Asmodeus five brigades of Bartor, uh, essentially the collected armies of the first five demon lords, excluding those of Fraz Urblu himself, which remains to this day the largest force the Nine Hells has ever mustered. Um, awestruck by the array of power rallied at his doorstep, Fraz Urblu sent his force out to meet it. So focused was he on the events that transpired outside his tower that he ceased paying attention to what was happening inside. After having received a boon of power from Asmodeus to allow him to successfully navigate the tower's labyrinth, Despater scaled as uh, Fraz Urblu's fortress and took the key that held the secrets of the Iron Tower. Possessing controlling o control over the tower, Despater claimed the name of Asmodeus and cast Urblu Fraz Urblu from its top, sending him plummeting through the hells bound in thick brimstone chains to meet the Archduke of Nisus himself. During his fall, all that saw the cursing, howling Fraz Urblu mocked him for his failure, mounting millions of jeers on him, so that by the time he met Asmodeus, he was absolutely mad with rage. With Fraz Urblu's having already lost his status in hell, Asmodeus banished Fraz Urblu from the Nine Hells forever, marking him with a seal that would prevent him from ever entering Bartor again. And it's to this day, he cannot enter the Nine Hells. Fraz Urblu next found himself 
in a place totally unfamiliar to him, a jungle where rivers ran red with blood and the air buzzed with insects the size of men. As teams of demons began following his devilish aura and ambushing him, he quickly recognised that he was in the abyss, in the thick of battle between the Tanari and the Oberinth. Using his peerless shape-changing, shape-changing skills, Faz Urblues disguised himself as a Tanari and quickly took command of the force in the area, recognising the opportunity to gain stature if he took a side in the conflict. His devilish, devilish powers, unable to be fully taken by Asmodeus, and tactical knowledge allowed him to achieve victory and attract the attention of the leaders of the Tanari forces, a pair of demons that would later become Orcus and Demogorgon. Alongside them, Fraser Urblues established himself as a dominant force in the rebellion and a key figure in the plan to assassinate the Queen of Chaos. So, this is when the demons were fighting against their creators, the Oberinth, um, and they were fighting their way through the many dimensions and ruining the many dimensions of the Abyss. When the trio of generals defeated the queen and Demogorgon focused, uh, f- fused with her Oberth form, each of them accepted a portion of her essence as a means of balancing their power with uh, her power with theirs. So, for Fraz Urblu, this action had the opposite effect, causing him to grow weaker due to conflict with his infernal powers. And after all, he was a devil, not a demon. Now unable to continue his facade in the face of the two strengthened demon lords, Fraz Urblu once again fled in disgrace. Although he has lost his status as one of the most powerful demon princes, Fraser Blue still possesses enough strength to maintain his current status. With his identity out, but his ability to perfectly disguise himself from most beings still intact, Fraser Blue remains a constant threat to both demons and devils alike. He schemes most of all to find a way to remove the seal that bars him from re-entering Bartor, and then taking back the Iron Tower that was rightfully his. In the tales of Gygax and Fraz Urblu was one of the four demons lords to make the big debut in Monsters and Magic Items, appendix of the 1982 AD&D adv- adventure module, The Lost Caverns of Sojanth. There, I, 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 Sojkanth? Man, that's hard to pronounce. Sojkanth? I'll have to look that up. There he was named the Prince of Deception, the ruler of the flat and featureless layer of the Abyss. He was also revealed to be one of the most powerful beings long imprisoned beneath Castle Greyhawk, and who yearned for vengeance against the peoples of the world as a result. And we'll get to why he was in prison then, and exactly who imprisoned him, and what they were using him for in a moment. The backstory of Fraser Ublu's imprisonment comes from the uh, Gary Gygax and Rob Kuntz's original Castle Greyhawk campaign. The adventurers... Um, had discovered a bass relief demon face deep beneath the castle Greyhawk. This has led to Demon World, the staging ground for a demonic invasion of Ueth, but also the prison of Fraz Urblu. And when the adventurers were tricked into freeing the demon lord, he showed his gratitude by taking them both back to the abyss, and they later returned minus a pair of their uh, vocal swords and a holy adventure. The Prince of Deception was mentioned erratically during the days of the first edition AD&D Monster Manual, uh, in 1980, uh, Monster Manual 2 in 1983, can, contained much the same information as the Lost Chasms of uh, Sojanth, while Manual of the Planes in 1987 noted that Fraser Ublu was still rebuilding his abyssal home following his imprisonment. Like most first edition demon lords, Fraz Ublu then made a brief appearance in the Throne of Bloodstone in 1988, through that adventure added, um, well, it was a little bit added to his lore. Meanwhile, Gary Gygax made active use of him outside of the official d d canon, renaming him Vaz Ur Hlu in Dance of Demons in 1988. The last Gord the Rogue novel had um, he wrote following his departure from TSR. During the second edition AD&D era, Fraz Urblu was all but forgotten. His most notable appearance was in Faces of Evil, The Fiends, in 1997, which simplified his name to Fraz Urblu, and was uh, he finally had his home plane named Hollow's Heart, the uh, 176th official layer of the Abyss. With the advent of third edition D&D in 2000, Trap Urblu returned to the spotlight and put his abyssal house in order. The process started with the Dragon Knight 330, uh, Dragon 333 issue in June 2005, where the uh, the article Demonomicon of Igwil article presented a detailed account of the Demon Lord and Hollow's Heart, and whose cover featured the first full color portrait of the Prince of Deception. And my friends, I'm going to read that entire article to you. 
because um, that's that's what I do. I read the entire thing and uh, get the information from it. And it's a really good article. So, yeah. Uh, that article also revealed the architect, architect of Fraser Ublu's imprisonment, the wizard Zagig. Uh, this narrative was solidified in his next appearance in Fiendish Codex 1, Hordes of the Abyss, in 2006. Great book, that one. After which the transition to 4th edition D&D revealed more of that story. And a pair of articles in Dragon 414 and Dungeon 208 told of Igwilv, Grav, the Igweave, Wilv and Grast affair, detailing how the Witch Queen Igwilv had helped Zagig imprison Fraz Urblu and how that led her to later imprisonment of the demon Lord Grast and all that developed as a result. Uh, yeah, so, yes. Um, let's get to the actual article itself. And it starts with this little, uh, like a nursery rhyme, um, an old folk song and warning of the cult of Fraz Urblu. He comes in winter, compassion and trust. He dances in spring with our love and your lust. He calls in the summer and serve him you must. He withers in autumn. You save him from dust. Your father, your mother, your lover, your child. His son, his daughter, his minion beguiled. And now that you've offered your life and your soul, he'll drag you to ruin and swallow you whole. Charming. Great. Lovely stuff. Okay. So, let's get to the article itself. This is from direct from the pages of the Demonomicon of Igwilv, a witch uh, of the Forgotten Realms, Fraz Urblu, the Prince of Deception. For countless eons, Fraz Urblu, Prince of Deception, uh, reigned supreme as Lord of the Abyssal Realm of Hollow's Heart. The Demonomicon of the Witch Queen Igwilv records him as one of the primal lords of the abyss, one of the first demons to rise to dominance. This claim might or might not, may or might not be true. But images of this demon prince have been found in ruins so ancient that no books remain to speak of their builders. His sect is one of the oldest known demon cults. He has never been the most powerful of the uh, lords of the abyss, yet he has weathered the rise and fall of countless enemies and allies. Through it all, Fraz Urblu remains a terrible constant amid the writhing change of the abyssal nobility. Yet even eternal eternity can be finite. When an upstart human mage named Zagig Vragirn uh, dared summon him to the material plane Fraz Urblu viewed it as little more than an opportunity to spend a few weeks in the mortal realm savaging and ruining a few unexpected nations yet when the demon prince manifested in Zagig's great summoning chamber the wizard confronted the demon with a powerful artifact known as the Echo Lance in an attempt to carve away a portion of the fiendish essence when Zagig tried to use the artifact on him Fraz Urblu took it in his hands and just jointed the artifact's power. Yet something went wrong. As the artifact's magic was torn away and ruined, Fraz Urblu felt the same force rebounding into his own being. In an instant, his powers were stripped from him and Zagig's true purpose became clear. The Echo Lance was simply bait. And now that Fraz Urblu had taken it, Zagig had no prob problem using his magic to imprison the Prince of Deception. In a massive stone bas relief deep within the dungeons below Castle Greyhawk. For more than 200 years, Fraz Urblu remained in prison there. His only entertainment were the few thieves, intruders, and explorers who stumbled into his presence. For Zagig had given him leave to riddle and torment those unfortunate enough to encounter him. Yet the dungeons beneath Castle Greyhawk are vast, and as those years wore on, Fraz Urblu's visitors became less frequent. Eventually, he was all alone with nothing but his anger. For hundreds of years, his rage grew until a fateful day long, not long ago, when two young adventurers came upon a curious bas-relief deep underground and unwittingly followed its advice. So, uh, they've got a stat block for him from an earlier edition of the game where he's listed as a huge outsider, a chaotic evil Tanhari, uh, with 629 hit points plus nine to initiative his speed is 30 feet and he can fly with his wings 50 feet uh, with an average maneuverability his armor class is enormous um, so he'd definitely be within the 20 range for fifth edition and yeah he attacks with a slam attack melee attack uh, 1d8 plus his strength and uh, his level equivalent bonus so his full attack each round is two slams and a bite and a tail attack and he has a reach attack of 15 feet. 
Special attacks is um, he can constrict people with his tail, use deception, disjunctive touch, improved scrabbed spell-like abilities. Uh, he can summon other demons. Um, and he's got damage reduction for, I would say, every every type of uh, normal item. Um, it would be uh, something like a plus one sword or, or, or higher would be required to hurt him. He's immune to electricity, lightning. Uh, immune to mind affecting effects immune to poison uh, he's inscrutable can't be mind read um, he's a master of magical items he has low light vision he's got all the traits of a uh, batizu um, and he's got resistance to acid cold fire and he can see the invisible he's got basically he's got true sight he's got spell res uh, resistance to lower level spells telepathy out to 200 feet and he's got advantage on his fort, uh, advantage on saving throws for constitution and uh, dexterity and wisdom. He All of his stats are over 20, um, with his highest being strength and constitution. His intelligence is genius level, 24. Wisdom's 21 and charisma is 27. He's, he's one charming guy. So he's got skills in deception, of course. Um, uh, he's got a lot of magical knowledge, uh, knowledge of the planes, geography, um, history of the planes. He's an ancient being. Um, yeah, so he's got whatever skills are required, I would say. And yeah, he's usually encountered alone in the abyss. Uh, he may also be accompanied by a bevy of succubi um, and rakshasa. Um, yeah, he's got quadruple the usual amount of treasure. And of course, um, he's got dark speech. Uh, book, uh, that's from the Book of Vile Darkness. This hulking menace stands just over 18 feet in height, despite his hunched posture. His muscular, gorilla-like body is covered with short, coarse hair of a pale blue hue. His feet are broad and splayed, and his hands are large, but the fingers relatively stubby and tipped with long, jagged talons. Two vast black bat-like wings protrude from his back and his tail is long and is hairless, with a grey base uh, fading to a razor-sharp blue tip. His head is bald and grey-skinned, save for tufts of ragged hair hanging from his jowls. Large and ragged uh, ears protrude from the centre of his skull uh, to well above his pointed ridged... Oops, sorry. Large and ragged ears from the centre of his skull? And well above uh, his pointed ridged peak. This uh, uh, eyes are relatively small but uh, burn with a cold blue light. Uh, yet the most terrible aspect of his visage is his mouth, which is overly large and filled with huge fangs. Great Fraz Urblu has only recently returned to dominance over his realm in the Abyss. Having spent centuries imprisoned on the material plane, he lost a notorious weapon and magic item during this time and has developed a tremendous hatred of the material plane and its inhabitants as a result. Humans, in particular, are his most hated foes, for it was a human who imprisoned him against his will and that he most often encountered, and he hates them. For now, Fraz Urblu strives to regain control of Hollow's Heart, the 176th layer, as I mentioned, but soon plans to launch a series of attacks against the material plane, his ultimate goal being its utter ruin. The demon's traditional symbol is the staff of Frazurblu, a jeweled scepter of adamantine cast at the end to resemble a tangle of five bestial arms that splay outward to grip a horned and fanged humanoid skull. However, since his escape from the material plane and return to the abyss, he has largely abandoned his symbol and is today... Uh, it is akin to his realm on the abyss mutable ever-changing yet always terrible to behold the one common feature that runs throughout his various symbols is that of a partially devoured human skull in which the eyes remain yet have been rotated in their sockets so as to stare upon the ruined interior in combat traditionally he preferred to deal with the enemies through deception and guile today the prince of deception is just as likely to crush maim and grind his foes to pace with his formidable formidable weaponry uh, traditionally, this I know outside of this article, is that he is famed for his magical bow. It's a long bow that um, basically fires energy arrows um, with tremendous force and from a great distance and with great accuracy. Um, and he manages to channel his own power through it. Um, so this was the sort of bow that was, um, you see it in the Dungeons and Dragons cartoon. 
that that bow that fires energy arrows that's basically fraser blue's bow yeah so and of course he's a amazing deceiver so on with the story um fraser blue's staff is a major artifact once fraser blue's coveted sign of power this potent and notorious staff allowed the demon lord to to bend incredible uh, to bend incredibly huge armies of demons and other creatures to his will he used the staff to command the allegiance of many powerful and unique demons and no small number of champions of good found themselves enslaved by its might this artifact is a jeweled scepter of adamantine cast and the end to resemble a tangle of five bestial arms that splay outward to grip a horned and fanged humanoid skull thick oily red smoke leaks upward from the skull's eye sockets the demon lord's enemies tried many times to capture or destroy the staff but until Fraz Urblu was imprisoned under castle greyhawk none of the attempts met any success today even though Fraz Urblu herself himself is once again free his staff remains missing some rumors hold that Fraz Urblu's staff was destroyed by an alliance of demon lords while others maintain that the staff is hidden in a vault in the material plane said at times to be located in a dwarven citadel below a great city's sewers others or um, in a remote wizard's mountain keep in a way all of these are correct since the staff was was, was sundered and the parts scattered to ensure that fraser blue could never reclaim it unfortunately the parts retain their magic and if brought together on fraser blue's abyssal lair they'll instantly form into the mighty artifact again when held fraser blue's staff automatically extends and enlarges any in enchantment cast by the wielder including any uh, cast from staffs and wands including the staff itself the staff can be used to cast the following spells at will charm person command and suggestion three times a day the uh, three times a day the owner of the staff can use it to cast charm monster with dc 21 dominate person dc 23 or mind fog dc 23 once per day the owner can use it to cast mass charm monster uh, dc 26 demand at 26 or dominate monster at 27 fraz urblu's staff can also be used as a rod of rulership see page 236 of the original dungeon master's guide save that only creatures with intelligence scores of 16 or higher are entitled to a dc 22 will save against the negate to negate the effect uh, the staff can be used for up to three days per week in this manner and the duration need not be continuous if used as a weapon it is plus five adamantine unholy great club crikey so yeah it's uh it weighs eight pounds so mighty weapon indeed okay oh one of the things that he's got is a disjunctive touch he can actually uh channel some of his life force i think it's 50 hit points um, of his total and he can dispel basically any spell that's thrown at him he can he can just channel his his power his essence into uh negating magic uh right yeah, fraser Ubu is loath to travel directly to the material plane since the memories of his imprisonment there are still painful and fresh in his mind when he requires a direct hand in matters there he is more likely to send his aspect a physical embodiment of a small portion of his life force in most cases this embodiment is a manifestation of his rage and hatred for humanity Fraser Urblu's aspect looks identical to his true form, although its presence is much less overwhelming and it only stands 12 feet tall. Only stands 12 feet tall. Sometimes his faithful can use spells like Planet Ally or Planet Binding to call upon his aspect. The stats presented here are represented the least of Fraser Urblu's aspects. Other more powerful incarnations of his aspects certainly exist. Uh, for more general information on aspects, consult pages blah 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 of blah blah blah. So yeah, basically it's a less powerful version of himself. His goals before imprisonment below Castle Greyhawk, uh, Fraz Urblu was content to dwell in his personally tailored realm. The Prince of Deception had complete control over his abyssal realm and could reform his appearance, its appearance with a thought. Um, it was said to consist of a white powder that he could mentally manipulate into anything that he desired. The ability to cause mountains to sink into oceans, to cause chasms to swallow entire cities, and to call up massive guardians of stone and lava made his lair a difficult place for his enemies to assault, to say the least. Fraser Urblu knew this, and as a result, often rarely ventured out of his domain. Instead, he was content to spend his time tormenting the, his minions and the legions of prisoners they brought before him, in hopeful attempts to curry his momentary favour, or into deceiving rival demon lords and ladies into appearing in his court and taking from them what he desired usually uh, entertainment in the form of humiliation but sometimes partaking in more 
gluttonous or carnal amusements. For a time, Fraser Erblu counted all of the rulers of the Abyss as his enemies, yet they could never set aside their personal differences long enough to forge an alliance capable of taking him in his lair. I mean, it just wasn't worth it. So a few of his cannier enemies did the next best thing. Zagig had been formulating plans for the imprisonment of Fraser Erblu for some time and had engaged the Witch Queen Igwiluv's support and advice for the project. It was more through her influence and connections with other demons that came to grant Zagig the equal lance and provide him with crucial hints into Fraz Erblu's probable true name. When the Prince of Deception became trapped, his enemies descended upon his realm in terrible, endless waves of devastation. And of course, they were defenseless as their master was not present. Without their master, they were unable to, relay, uh, to use the realm's mutability and they were slaughtered completely. Not long after the domain itself collapsed, mountains withered away, seas filled with gravel, forests to burn to the ground, and deserts blew away on the nether wind. In the space of only a few years, the realm had been reduced to nothingness. All that remained was an endless white plain of powdery sand under an empty black sky. It was also at this time that Fraz... Uh, maybe that's the plain of Dis. Or maybe not, I don't know. It was also at this time that Fraser Blue's enemies seized control of his infamous staff. It was this powerful artifact that Fraser Blue commanded with such massive legions of, legions of demon spawn, and through its power that he would control the nature and shape of his realm. Each demon lord tried to claim it as his own, and in the ensuing battle the staff was torn into five pieces, each of which was cast through the multiverse. Some of these shards have since been recovered, but this is much like the uh, Rod of Seven Parts narrative, isn't it? By wizards, cultists, liches, and others who covet magic, while others made uh, were captured by agents of law and good and sealed away in vaults of hidden tombs in the far corners of reality. Fraser Erblubes remained imprisoned on the material plane for well over 200 years, and Zagig refined his powers over that time, using similar methods of diaphic imprisonment to capture and imprison nine demigods in specially prepared cells deeper in the dungeon below Castle Greyhawk. Eventually, Zagig passed from the world, leaving his ruins to chance and time. Eventually, one of the imprisoned demigods, Ayus um, the Old, managed to tear free from his prison, and the resulting stain on the other cells caught a strain on the other cells caused a cascade of magical failures, and in that time, most of the other imprisoned deities escaped. Yet, Fraz Erblu's prison remained too strong. Only when a pair of adventurers discovered the Basra Relief had been bound inside was a demon, Prince able to capitalise on the weakened state of the prison. He tricked the adventurers into performing a series of tasks, which had finally quest they inevitably set the Prince of the Deception free. After a desperate attempt to call on one of their gods for aid, Fraser Erblu was delighted to learn that most of his powers had returned during his long imprisonment. He took up his saviours and his great arms and returned to his realm on the abyss, only to find it gone along with his coveted staff with this final insult something within Fazerblu changed forever the terrible rage and hatred he had nursed during his imprisonment bloomed inspiring him with a rage that now infuses every fiber and every thought of his being Fazerblu has spent the better part of the past 25 years rebuilding his realm known as hollow's heart this abyssal layer still consists of a vast realm of white sand to black sky. Here and there, pockets of terrain have appeared uh, where minor unique demons have laid claims and learned um, on a smaller scale to mould uh, the terrain to their will. Frab Fraz Erblu has routed and ruined most of the demonic squatters and has slowly been reshaping things to his liking. Yet without his staff, the task is arduous and lengthy. In addition, Fraser Erblu must constantly defend his realm from demonic incursion, as the other demon lords have not forgotten their hatred of the Prince of Deception. So far, none have managed to force him from his home, though Grast, Demogorgon, and Sokoth Benoth all come close before uh, Fraser Erblu had managed to repulse the armies from his realm. The process of rebuilding it is, as a result, slow and painful, and um, all too frequent with each uh yeah oh yeah he's reminded of his imprisonment and threat there despite the hardships he continues to make progress the terrain of his realms grows daily as do the ranks of his subjected demon slaves and thralls once frozerblu has reworked his realm to his liking and gathered what he deems to be an acceptable army he'll be ready to crusade against humanity a scary thought indeed 
Uh, Fraser Uru dreams of war against the material plane, whereas most of the other demon lords see humanity as a fertile field in which to plant seeds, seeds of cruelty, hatred, and perversion to mature until souls ripe for plucking and turning into demons themselves. Fraser Uru sees only an insult to his powerful ego. As long as even one human lives, he cannot release the powerful rage Zaggy gifted to him. And so Fraser Uru plans to crusade of red ruin. In his dreams, he sees himself leading an army of demons, undead, and other monstrosities against the whole of humanity, a war he has no intention of ending until all that remains of the material plane is the dust that they turned his home plane into. His cult can be divided into two distinct groups. The lesser of those two groups is loosely organized into cells. Each of these cells operates independently with the leaders of each in contact with the leaders of other cells. These groups focus their efforts on corrupting secular establishment, establishments like guilds, uh, governments, and other organizations. By infiltrating these groups, the cults can leech off the profits generated by them and aid in funding the more dangerous cults. The greater, more dangerous cults are known as the cults of deception. The cults of deception typically consist of a dozen or so members, most of which have at least a few levels in cleric. Clerics of Faz Urblu have access to domains of chaos, evil, trickery, and war. Faz Urblu's favoured weapon is the Great Club. If you use the Book of Vile Darkness, his clerics have access to the demonic domain. This differs somewhat in other accounts where they also have access to the time uh, domain, and their favoured weapon is the Great Bow, obviously. In addition to clerical servitors, a thrall of Faz Urblu always leads a cult of deception. While they worship Fraser Blue, they mask his worship, this worship in the guise of another deity, typically a good aligned lesser deity. Using deception, illusions, enchantment, and other forms of trickery, these cultists operate small shrines located in rural areas and outwardly often do not do a lot of good for the uh, community and otherwise don't have access to um, powerful healing. So they masquerade as healers, hedge wizards, that sort of thing, and go about their daily business. And people are unaware of their true motives. Um, so, as a general rule, a cult of deception won't charge money for their spellcasting services, since the lesser cults who siphon money and other resources from the guilds and other things fund them. Um, sacrifices to Fraz Ublu from the cults of deception occur only once a year, but the cult typically takes the entire year preparing for the sacrifice, and since the sacrifice must be someone who has been deceived into joining the religion, the cultists prefer to use a lawful good victim, gaining the victim's trust and friendship and support over the years, uh, over the year, and then often one of the cult members volunteers Uh, to become the sacrifice's lover. During this year, the cult does everything it can to ensure that the chosen sacrifice is comfortable, happy, and ignorant of any deception. At a time, as the time for sacrifice draws near, the cult reveals the victim, to the victim things are not well. Perhaps the high priest has an incurable disease and the church is running low on funds or some other rival church is about to force them to change location or move out of town. This is all a ruse set up by them. Usually these conflicts are completely false, but a clever cult builds an existing problem to further cloak the truth from its victim. The cult reveals to its victim that, he, that if he does a few important tasks for the church, things might just be salvageable. Usually the cult sends its sacrifice on two or three relatively easy missions each of which ideally seems to be for the greater good on the surface, but underneath the competition is something horrible or evil, such as stealing an artifact which is keeping back an evil thing, or assassinating somebody who has been painted as an evil person. Um, yeah, character assassination leading to uh, dragging them before a, a kangaroo court and having a crowd of people kill an innocent person, that sort of thing. When the time comes for sacrifice, the cult reveals to the victim that things are even more dire and it's even than its leaders believe. They'll paint it as a bleakest picture possible for the victim, suggesting that it is the displeasure of their deity that has caused this terrible doom. Further, they insinuate that only by sacrificing one of their own to their god can things be made right. If one of the cultists has taken the sacrifice as a lover, the cult selects this cultist as the sacrifice, hoping that the intended victim offers to take his lover's place. So... <laughs> That's so evil. Otherwise, the cult tries other methods to get the victim to offer himself as a sacrifice in deception. Often the cult infers that a sacrifice is welcomed into the afterlife as a martyr and a hero and that the deity grants the sacrifice immortality, wealth, power and glory. 
If the character is truly worthy and willing to be sacrificed for the good of the church, the cultists even hint that their deity has been known to restore such favoured minions to life on the material plane, often with vast increases in their wealth and power. Of course, this is all lies, ruses to get the victim to willingly sacrifice himself to Freya's Urblu, usually with uh, such victims go to the graves without realising they've been tricked. These sacrifices to Fraser Urblu in such a manner do not go on uh, do not go on to their normal deserved afterlives. Rather, they are consigned to the wretched city of Zoragmelok in Hollow's Heart. Fraser Urblu himself accepts the sacrifice in the guise of whatever god the cult had been falsely worshipping and places the character's spirit in what seems a perfectly idyllic afterlife. However, these rewards are false, and Fraser Urblu takes great delight in slowly stripping away the disguise over the course of many months or even years. Eventually, the victim realizes the truth, by which point it's too late. Only then does Fraser Urblu pay the victim's soul a personal visit to explain just what he has done. The Prince of Deception uses his powers of illusion to grant a vision of how the sacrifice's delusions have harmed those he loved in life and allowed evil and chaos to spread. And finally, when the victim has sunk as far as he can into despair, he's consumed by the demon lord. Characters slain in this manner cannot be brought back to life without direct divine intervention from another god, and that's going to be pretty tough to get. Thralls of Fraser Urblu are deceivers and charlatans. They work behind the scenes, worming their, wi- worming their wiles into the minds of nobles, leaders, and heroes. These are the grimmer worm tongues, the manipulating uh, backstabbers behind the scenes, working for the glory of the Prince of Deception. When exposed, thralls of Fraser Urblu are no less dangerous, combining powerful spellcasting with formidable melee skills. They have little problem dealing with those they cannot influence in more subtle manners, Yet their most important function is to seduce and delude powerful adventurers, tricking them into unknowingly accepting Fraser Urblu into their minds and souls, making them clay for the Prince of Deception to mould into new soldiers for his armies. Bards and warlocks make the best thralls for Fraser Urblu, since their abilities allow them to qualify for his, um, his gift. He bestows magical power upon them. Um... They also make excellent thralls for the Prince of Deception. Certain clerics and favoured souls can also qualify for the class as well if they focus on domains that grant illusion spells. Despite their preferred class, many thralls of Frazulu take a few levels in rogue or fighter to augment their skills in uh, melee combat. So, yeah. And it uh, goes on to list class features and things as these cultists and thralls of Frazulu. Um Yeah. It's kind of like an elite class. Typical 3.5. They can't have anything go by without making some specific class for it. Yeah. Um, Their illusionary powers are pretty powerful. Like a a very powerful illusionist um, cultist of Fraz Urblu has the ability to actually manipulate reality around them quite well. Um, And they also have minions. Um, He's got these creatures Fraser was much of his time in the ancient past pursuing a corrupt sect of Rakshasas, promising them power and glory if they would only shift their allegiance to him. He met with moderate amount of success with his program, and even today, large numbers of Rakshasas serve the Prince of Deception. Many of these Rakshasas have been corrupted by their master's whispers and are now chaotic evil, and most possess levels of sorcerer. These Rakshasas are known collectively as the Hollow Rajas, and they see to the rulership and government such as it is of the various regions in hollow's heart a hollow raja is difficult to mistake for a standard rakshasa since each of these corruptors rakshasas have different heads and related to uh different animal themes none of them adhere to the typical tiger theme common to most rakshasas interesting during his uh, long imprisonment, many of the Hollow Rajas pre- perished in the resulting chaos, but some of them survived by fleeing to other planes. Eventually, these survivors drifted back to the abyss and rebuilt small strongholds on the abandoned layer. They were able to re- form small sections of terrain to lord it over on Fra- in Frazublu's absence, and when he returned to his throne in Zoragmalok, Mor- M- these Rakshasas who offered them him their lands were rewarded by being allowed to remain the rulers of their domain. Those who resisted were annihilated. 
and their domains given over to other more worthy minions so interesting there's also um, a creature this creature is twisted and deformed that body looks somewhat like that of a plucked and wingless vulture but its short legs appear humanoid as do its arms that end in large bird-like talons it has a long neck like a vulture yet its head more closely resembles an eels with overly long jaws filled with translucent needle-like teeth it stands just over three feet in height its thin tail is outlandishly long reaching nearly 16 feet in length and resembling a knotted coil of twisted hair threaded with tiny barbs and cruel hooks these wretched looking demons are rather disgusting in their true form yet they are masters of, of lies and deception and prefer to operate in the form of an immaculately dressed and well-mannered halfling or gnome they delight in the role of advisor and take special pleasure in deluding any otherwise kind and benevolent leader into accepting them in this role their whispered advice of a skircher which is their name gives uh, false allies are intended to seem helpful and wise on the surface yet when acted upon bring misery and pain and horror just as a succubus tempts mortals with sins of the flesh the skircher tempts mortals with sins of the mind a skircher is three feet tall in its natural form and weighs 45 pounds so shapeshifters they use magic spell like abilities and they can also uh summon other demons tanari so yeah cool little illustration of them there what else we got in this article his realm Frazulu's realm is known as Hollow's Heart. At one point, his realm filled the entire 176th layer of the abyss, but since Frazulu's imprisonment, the entire place reverted to a featureless plane of white dust under a black sky. Over the past 25 years since it was released, though, Frazulu has made great strides toward rebuilding Hollow's Heart. Today, the region is massive by any account, equaling the size of most major continents on the material plane. Yet still, this is a tiny pinpoint of once was the uh, playground of the Prince of Deception. The accompanying map depicts the current configuration of Hollow's heart, but without a staff, he cannot ideally reconfigure the shape of his realm, and the process of adding and forming new terrain and features from the surrounding wasteland is long and exhausting for the Demon Prince because he has to use his own power. Currently, Frazubli's minions include several of Hollow, the Hollow Rajas. Um, they rule many of these regions, but a few, such as the Demon's Teeth and the Blood Dunes, are little more than wildernesses. The skies above Hollow's Heart remain black, like a starless night sky. Nevertheless, the landscape remains brightly lit, as if by an invisible noontime sun. The supernatural light casts no shadows, which gives the realm a strange, almost two-dimensional feeling. I'd imagine it looks a bit like um, Borderlands. A brief description of the major cities. We have uh, Athawin. After the city of Zorag Melok, the streets of Athwin are perhaps the most decadent and debased of Hollow's Heart. The succubi and searchers who rule the city of 9,000 fiendish orcs and half-orcs use a large number of human slaves deemed unfit for the Red Rapture uh, to tend to their vile needs as necessary. Visitors to Athwin, uh, more often than not, are either captured or eaten by the orcs or enslaved by the succubi and searcher lords of the city. The city itself consists of a dizzying tangle of curving towers and looming domes made of red marble. Uh, Nerashlia, Nerash, Nerashlia, a succubus bard, is the most powerful creature in the city and for the last decade her word has been the primary influence on Athwin's growth. Athwin is the only city of Hollow's Heart not ruled by one of the Hollow Rajas, but the corrupted Rakshasas seem content with this especially since they often visit the city for more carnal offerings and i imagine it's a neutral ground place that they can negotiate with each other the blood dunes is a vast desert of red uh, blood red particles known for its withering climate temperatures here are never far below severe heat and often reach levels of extreme heat close inspection of the sticky red particles that make up the sands of this desert reveal them to be crumbling scabs and clots of dried blood the blood dunes are infested with any manner of undead and many powerful mummies and liches lurk in the mysterious ruins that are partially buried in this massive morbid dune the bone pus of all the settlements in <laughs> hollow's heart bone pus is the most wretched bone pus that's the name of a wow that's a great name 
The small town of uh, 1560 fiendish goblins is ruled by Ron Tuckus. Uh, Ron Tuckus, a crocodile-headed hollow Raja Rakshasa sorcerer who treats bone pass as his own personal dining table, the goblins are only barely able to keep up with Ron Tuckus' Tuckus's appetite with their own few, uh, fecundity. Uh, the buildings of this dripping soggy town are made of rotting wood and strips of poorly preserved skin and leather stretched over frames made of twisted sticks harvested from nearby nearby scar wood what a oh boy that would be awful the deep uh the death root woods spread throughout the lowlands and foothills about the uh, demon's teeth mountains the deep uh, death root woods consist of a forest of twisted diseased trees primarily abyssal variants of oak and pine that look like uh countless bones um litter the forest floor here oh i've seen a picture of this but so this is lots of uh, like skeletal trees um with the the ground is basically consists of thousands and thousands and thousands of skeletons but close inspection reveals those to be the wretched roots of the trees not actually skeletons at all numerous tainted plant monsters lurk in these woodlands and rumors hold that a circle of 13 half fiend treants rules the verdant corruption wow fascinating so this would be the uh yeah there'd be all sorts of um plant nasties in this place shambling mounds i would imagine the demon's teeth nearly a third of hollow's heart consists of a sprawling reach of twisted unsettled mountains known as demon's teeth for as Urblu created these mountains first when he returned to the abyss tearing the vast jagged peaks out of the ground in a rage that lasted for many years before he had finally calmed down enough to turn his attention to less violent terrain the rocks and faces of these mountains are razor sharp an explorer in this region must take extra care to avoid numerous lacerations from the ever-present surfaces uh, four large and deep lakes of turgid bile lurk in the depths of the demon's teeth what manner of creatures dwell in these mountains and the terrible lakes of bile can only be guessed at but it seems likely that these uh, those who have lost favor with the prince of deception have taken to hiding in this vast stretch of vile wilderness the drooling jungle is a horrible steaming jungle of parasite uh, fleshy trees that constantly draw mucus and poison from their muttering mouths that stud the trunks and make this region the most nauseating of all of hollow's heart Ugh, turgid breath and quivering flesh rising from a sodden ground the ground here is strangely warm soft and rubbery also like a massive sheet of skinless a uh, senseless flesh that covers the thick black uh, which is covered with thick black hairs that double as undergrowth all manner of fiendish monsters dwell here including massive basilisks strange hydras with the ability to spew acid and legions of bagalura demons that uh, hoot and gibber in the branches above a gigantic now fish need known only as the gardener is thought to dwell somewhere in this region getting up to no good no doubt the flenses a uh, jagged range of volcanoes constantly burn uh, belches burning ash and lava into the black skies above hollow's heart the surrounding mountains have a strange canted slopes almost as if they have perched like rows of enormous razor blades ready to strip the flesh of anything that comes too close the forever gash this long strip of land stretches uh it consists of raw material of hollow's heart a sheet of fine white powder for reasons unclear even to phrase Urblu, this particular strip of land resists his attempt to transform it and shape, shape it so it runs through the demon's teeth a strange incongruity to the tortured lands that surround it the harrowfen is a murky swampland um, with, uh, which abuts the tainted thick waters of the hollow sea as with the waters um, that wash into it these lowlands um, pool and they concentrate the sea's poison into an incredible degree creatures in contact with the waters of harrowfen must make a dc 15 fortitude save each round or take 1d4 points of constitution damage um, so i'd imagine that's levels of exhaustion after a while um how that would rule it i, I guess so from yeah so it's poisonous liquids the creatures that ingest this liquid um basically have to make uh, saving throws versus death the only creatures that live here are those who are immune to the poisons naturally demons thrive in this environment being immune to poison uh Hezrals and skull vein are particularly common here that's from uh fiend folio i believe uh fiend folio page 54 
The Hollow Sea is a sizable ocean of foul, tainted water that serves as a natural focus for the civilised portion of Hollow's Heart. The waters here look a little too green and smell a little too rancid to be mistaken for water. Anyone who drinks the waters of the Hollow Sea must make a um, constitution saving throw or take uh, one to two points of initial damage and secondary uh, constitution drain. The Hollow Sea is, for all intents and purposes, bottomless. Uh, a determined swimmer could, in theory, swim all the way down to emerge into the 177th layer of the abyss below. Numerous islands dot the surface of the Hollow Sea. These islands are rife with transient portals from other planes that often deposit unfortunate travellers here. Explorers and travellers on uh, basically wander around the toxic shores. The denizens of uh, Uanthar and Maggot often raid these islands for slaves and food. The waters of the Hollow Sea themselves are infested with half-fiend sharks and other horrors, um, including, or at least, um, a myriad of races, and there's a type of uh, demon from the Fiend Folio, page 57. Caranthus, the city, is the focus of Fraser Blue's cult. In many ways, the uh, places a single massive temple of iron and porphyry uh, built atop a sprawling mesa, uh, mesa that overlooks the hollow sea approximately 630 half elves dwarves halflings gnomes and other and half orcs dwell here now all serving under the gorilla headed hollow raja uh, what's his name kill ticker kill rick a rakshasa cleric um, notice, if you will, that there are no humans and their number. Uh, humans are not welcome here. Yeah, um, there's also some other places. Uh, Kuragoza, which is raven-headed hollow raja named Lyorcane, um, an eldritch knight who rules a small city. Uh, this city has a population of 7,500, mostly orcs, ogres, and fiendish gnomes. Its primary purpose is to process the legions of humans that the minions capture. A fair amount of these humans are harvested from the islands of the Hollow Sea, but most are stolen from their homes across the material plane by demons and cultists who seek to gain Fraser Blue's favour. A healthy human typically brings a bounty of 100 gold pieces, typically in, paid in credit and for the flesh pits of Athwin. Sickly humans are sold at greatly reduced prices to anyone who can afford them. Many end up being shipped to Athwin to serve as slaves or food. Maggot, the large town of Maggot, is the sister city of Uanthar. It's a population of about 3,200 orcs and ogres, many of which are sailors who spend weeks at a time plying the Hollow Sea in search of slave. Uh, Maggot is ruled by a boar-headed Hollow Raja, uh, Zurathani, a Rakshasa sorcerer. Zurathani considers himself an artist and delights in, uh, particularly in using magic to blend the flesh of living subjects together before using flesh to stone to create truly horrific statues for the city streets. Wow, that's great. The Red Rapture, uh, Rupture, uh, this vast stretch of plain serves as a massive killing ground for the humans captured by Fraser Blue's agents. All manner of torture devices can be found sprawled across this vast plain and the ground is a stinking morass of body of bloody mud. Rocks are primarily um, the torturers here and executioners rocks man i hate frogs got into a huge fight with them once so we have a nice map of hollow's heart uh looks like a basically like a big continent and a nice key good map gotta say lovely picture uh scar wood this vast woodland serves as fraser blue as a hunting ground he often seeks the um seeds this woodland with the scar covered survivors of the walls that surround zorag Malok allowing several years of to pass for the humans to build feral savage societies throughout the vast wood and then he uh he keeps the woods fairly free of dangerous predators and demons as a result to give his stock a chance to flourish before he goes in and hunts them the spiral of ugudink one of fraser blue's greatest enemies of his pre imprisonment times was ugudink the demon lord of worms and hungry parasites ugudink often burrowed into hollow's heart and each time fraser blue was forced to expend time and resources to track down and drive off the tenacious pest lord when he returned to hollow's heart after his imprisonment fraser blue discovered that ugadink had claimed a portion of his lair as his own and had infested it with his own writhing minions at the center of this region is a huge sprawling cabin that winds down 
from the surface all the way to the 177th layer of the abyss. Fraser Urblu tried to destroy the spiraling cabins but found he was unable to do so on three different attempts. Ugatink seems content to lurk in this region and seems to have no desire to expand his territory. So for now, Fraser Urblu suffers his presence. Um... So Zorag Malok, the mightiest city in all of Hollow's Heart, Zorag Malok is Fraz Ublu's own lair and fortress. The city itself is a massive um, place, circular in shape, and surrounded by adamantine walls covered with razors and hooks from which dangle countless human bodies. These bodies are kept alive by a small army of harpy clerics who flap from body to body, applying healing, food, and water as necessary to keep the moaning victims on just the side of life. Inside the city is an awesome display of impossible architecture. Corkscrew towers loom over to twisted um, dorges and vast amphitheatres. Yet despite its impressive skyline, the city is nearly empty. The only denizens of this enormous metropolis are Fraser Blue, his consorts, and the deceived, uh, the deceived, the humans that are sacrificed to the Prince of Deception, as mentioned before, by his cult. Each of the deceived dwells alone in a section of the city that has been changed to resemble what that person expects his afterlife, afterlife to look like. Illusionary neighbourhoods, friends and family populate these areas. Eventually, Fraser Blue strips these illusions away to gloat in the despair such a revelation engenders in the victim. The demon prince himself dwells in a massive fortress at the city centre and the behemoth structure that constantly changes and reforms its layout to suit its master's whim. Dozens of succubi consorts prowl the halls of Zrog Malok, most of which are also high-level bards, sorcerers, or clerics. So this is basically a large complex of the, uh, what do they call it, the Truman's world. So all these people believe that they're, that they're in a world of their own, but it's all a ruse surrounding them. So you may actually encounter um, minions that are just waiting for the, the, the victim to show up before they go about their task of imitating whoever they're supposed to be. Um, playing their role um, yeah so you may come across lunch rooms of demons who are in between their shift beguiling and and fooling the the poor sacrificial victim who's none the wiser in the center of this grand illusion so there you go quite an epically long uh, video there um, but it just gives you some of the an idea of what I actually read through when I'm uh, preparing to make a video so I'll condense that down into a five to six page script I'll probably miss out all of the like lo the locations and talking about his home plane and things like that and just basically cover the history and what he's up to now um, as it's relevant to fifth edition D&D &D. but um, skipping a lot of the the lore and history and things of um, that guy so there you go i hope that uh, fulfills your request if any of your other patrons have got requested content please let me know i'm more than willing to uh, go out of my way to fulfill any of your dungeons and dragons desires for information on any type of topic at all go ahead and challenge me catch you later guys